So this is a panel format. Each of the presenters is going to do a short presentation about their um, agency's work. And we'll do a short Q&A after each um, presentation. And then we'll do a longer Q&A at the end if there are things you want multiple um, presenters to comment on. Um, and the answer to the question is yes, we will share the slides with all attendees and registrants after the panel. So um, no need to scribble everything down or try to replicate the uh, diagrams that people may show. So my name is Lee Elon. I'm the Chief of Planning with the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. And our panelists today are Josh Friedman, who's the Executive Director of GIS with New York City Emergency Management. Harry Drew, the Deputy Director of Enterprise Geospatial Technology at New York City Department of Transportation, and Matt Croswell, the GIS Team Lead and Open Data Coordinator at New York City Department of City Planning. So uh, if I can have the next slide, please. And why are we doing this panel? Frankly, uh, all of our panelists love maps and data, and hopefully uh, you do too, which is why you're here. Uh, we have a strong interest in GIS and open data. We use it every day in our work. And we respect our colleagues' work and want to learn more about it and showcase how we're using data this year. And of course, the open data law encourages civic engagement. So kudos to all of you for being here to listen. Uh, you can click the next slide, please. So a few words about my office, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. It might not be as familiar to you as some of the other agencies here. And I'll admit right up front, we are not a powerhouse data generator. We use a lot of data though, and we do um, uh, produce some of our own. So what you're looking at here is probably the vehicle that most people use to look at our data. It's the speed portal. Uh, URL is up there, nyc.gov slash speed. And through it, you can look at a lot of data about the state's and the city's environmental cleanup program. My office's primary role is running the New York City Voluntary Cleanup Program that helps property owners and developers clean up contaminated sites before they build new buildings. Um, and to do that, obviously, we use a lot of data about um, soil contamination, groundwater depth, things like that. Um, and so we have data sets about the sites in our program, soil that's generated, clean soil that's generated um, from excavations on our sites. Plus we use a lot of state data and I encourage you to um, explore speed at your leisure. Um, if you can click the next slide, please. So what's new this year as the slide resolves itself, there we go, um, is we also work with community-based organizations that may not own properties, but want to do planning and pre-development work in areas that they're concerned about. And these are areas where they've received grants from our office or from the state uh, to do that kind of planning and pre-development work. And we've just updated that with some new grants that uh, the state has given out and that our office has given out. So you're welcome to check that out too. It's available on speed and next slide. And so these are uh, the data sets that we have on open data. Um, as I said, our cleanup sites, these shape files I just mentioned, the generating receiving sites from the Clean Soil Bank, and back 10 years ago when our office was getting off the ground, we did a study of historic land use information on vacant manufacturing zoned, privately owned property. And so since we got that data, we put it up for other people to look at. So you're welcome to find that by going to the open data site. If you search for OER, my office, um, you can find all this stuff. Um, so with that, uh, let's go to the next slide and get ready to hear from the next pan panelist, um, Josh Friedman. And while he's getting ready, I just want to know, are there any questions anybody has for me about my office or our data? 
If so, you can put them in the chat. I don't see anything. And okay, let's um, go on to Josh. Take it away. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Friedman. I'm executive director of the GIS division here at New York City Emergency Management. I've been with the city and with uh, emergency management for about 15 years now. Um, and I'm originally born and bred in the Bronx, so doing uh, city GIS in my home city. Um, so advance the slides, give you just a little bit of background for those who are, may not be familiar about what our agency does at emergency management. We used to be called OEM, if you know us as that. Um, same general mission. These are sort of the core areas, right, to help plan and prepare and mitigate uh, for and against different types of emergencies and disasters to help coordinate support response and recovery after uh, potential incidents to collect and disseminate information. And that's where we certainly play a role in the, in the geospatial world. And we have an education and outreach component as well in our agency to help educate the public about planning preparedness uh, and the threats from different potential hazards. We focus on planning for all different types of emergencies at our agency as much as possible. We try and be what we call all hazard, right? So techniques, plans, uh, things that can help us be ready for any type of emergency. Um, you can see images up here of some different examples. We are very, very weather focused. Um, that's that's a lot of what we do, um, preparing for whether it's winter season, heat season, coastal storm season. Um, but really, we prepare and are for and are involved in helping support response to uh, all types of emergency situations. Um, a lot of our work in the GIS part of emergency management is not public facing. There are a few key exceptions to that, which I'll just touch on briefly in a little bit. Um, but certainly the part of our work that is not say currently public facing involves us preparing for emergencies where we are going to be interacting with members of the public, trying to collect data to help facilitate improved response. Um, so that is a key component of what we do. These are kind of the, if you would say the pillars of, of the work that we focus on in emergency management GIS, data quality, data discovery, data coordination, both within our agency and, and interagency across the city and with other partners. Um, this in particular is, a, I think, a snapshot from some uh, automation procedure we put in place uh, within our public safety GIS data development center. Um, that's a, a subunit of our GIS team that's been um, up and running for many, many years now. Uh, we have a enterprise geodatabase of well over a thousand data sets, um, and we've been able to prove, I think, the benefit over the years of having staff who at least have a large percentage of their time able to be dedicated to uh, data development, data collection, data improvement, um, but also working on things like automation, as you see here, to, to be more efficient, um, working on coordination and governance issues with our colleagues. Um, in the realm of data discovery, which is a lot of what the Open Data Forum um, and discussions are about this week, um, this is a screenshot of uh, actually an internal product, a beta product that we have um, for us and, and some city colleagues as we test out ways to make data more discoverable. This is a hub site up on our Esri ArcGIS Online platform. Um, I believe that the city's OTI is is looking to hopefully do something similar um, for you know for the public. This is currently, as I say, for our city colleagues. Although we may, if there's a need, look to do something public facing in future. Um, but really, the same concepts, right? Figuring out how to make good, standardized, reliable, well sourced data accessible to those who need uh, to have it. The hurricane evacuation zones, uh, I dove into that a bit last year for those who, uh, who attended um, the similar panel. Um, if you're interested, certainly one of my favorite topics, I can provide uh, any length of detail uh, offline, but this is a, a key example, one of the top line data sets that we actually produce out of our agency. We're mostly consumers of other data or doing kind of value added work. The hurricane evacuation zones is a data set that we 
produce and our team in the jazz division and consultation and coordination with other partners in the agency and around the city where we're taking hurricane storm surge data in this case uh, from the national hurricane center and using that to ultimately create these hurricane evacuation zones to prepare for potential coastal storm hazards um, this is something that we try and actually push out as much as we can so this is one of the key public facing things this is a an image here folks should be able to see of our hurricane zone finder application um, this is actually looking at current and future state um, something that we're we're working on with city colleagues we expect to move to an esri platform so it will look a little different it's going to have the same functionality be available all the time but um you know, probably a little bit more resilient in terms of the architecture and and such behind the scenes um, and some links up there that you can see where we do push to to share make the data available um both the zones and kind of the underlying uh, data that informs the creation of those zones in the area of data coordination we do more and more um so really for the last decade kind of in the post sandy era if you would um, I would say a lot of our focus has not necessarily shifted as we continue to focus on foundational data, um, the kind of core data about the city's built and human landscape, but post-incident data, how we collect good standardized data after emergencies to help get services to people quicker, uh, to help coordinate response. And these happen to be some screenshots about, you know, I think this was some training work perhaps, um, but we've done a lot of work with different city colleagues and agencies using, in particular, the ESRI platform, um, Survey123, Collector, or now Field Maps, um, and ArcGIS Online to help coordinate, right? We'll have multiple agencies with perhaps slightly different mission focus, but using a common platform. And very important that if we have been able to plan and, and um, coordinate ahead of time, do some data governance work in terms of standardization, discussing how we're going to join up disparate data sets um, about, say, buildings in this case. Um, it really give, does give us a, a good opportunity to coordinate in live or in near time, so to speak. So move on, just take a couple minutes to focus on another big public facing um, portion of the work that we do and, and data and information that we try and get out there is something I also highlighted uh, last year. It's our city's natural hazard mitigation plan. Let's see the website up there, nychazardmitigation.com. Um, this is officially the city's natural hazard mitigation plan, right? It's updated every five years. Um, it's led by our uh, risk reduction and recovery team, and we have um, and one lead staff member in particular, but a lot of us in the GIS team um, provide a great deal of support for this effort. Um, the five-year updates will come out with the next official plan expected in just about one year from now in 2024. Um, so it's a good time to see, right, the, bill, the benefit of this being a dynamic platform now um, is that, you know, it can be more up-to-date than your traditional paper document. Um, and as part of that transition that took place, you know, really completely the last time around in 2019, and we'll build on that now is, you know, using this dynamic platforms that provide people better opportunity to access data that's meaningful to them. So one section we encourage folks to look at community risk assessment dashboards. You can see here, you can choose from any number of hazards that you might want to get information on and then tailor it to particular areas of the city. And our role in the GIS group is that we're feeding in from our GS Online organization, various dashboards, interactive maps, et cetera. Um, you can see Tableau is another platform that's also used um, to present some of this information. And folks can go, this is available anytime. You see the sublink there as well. And then in conclusion, just one other portion of the hazard mitigation plan universe I wanted to highlight, because this is a good example. When I started 15 years ago, I was a GIS specialist, also a hazard impact modeler was the other part of my title. So I was doing kind of early versions of this work. And the end product was a giant paperweight, right? about a five, 700 page paper document that the city could could submit and be in compliance to receive funding after disasters, et cetera, right? We get the same benefit now, but 
we have much better resources for people. So here you can go see um, we call mitigation actions data. So things that city agencies and other entities are working on over the years, right? How is money being spent? What type of projects are going on um, throughout the city? And there's a few forms again in the GIS team we helped um, support up on the website. You have a map that you can look at. Give a second to refresh. There's also a dashboard view. So again, all about trying to make the data more accessible for members of the community, members of the public, easier to digest, a little more meaningful. And then you can also access the database itself. And this is when there are periodic updates, again, much more frequently than the five-year um, plan release on open data as well. So you can find some of this data on the open data site. So I encourage folks to go and check out the site as a whole, not just the kind of geospatial resources, but there's a lot of great content up there. And that's what I have for the, this portion. So I see, as Lee mentioned, I don't know, you know, if there are general questions, maybe we'll hold those to the end and all the panelists can discuss. But if anybody has any specific questions, I can't really see the chats. So I don't know, Lee, if there's anything in there. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Josh. I'll read. We do have a question in the chat. Um, it's a technical question. Open data has certain data sets that are zip files. After downloading them, is there free software available to see the underlying maps mentioned in the description? Is ArcGIS and or EADRAS Imag Imagine software required to be locally installed on one's computer? Any suggestions to view it online in real time if open data does not have the mapping option for a specific data set? I mean, the, the open data team may have suggestions. I know there are a few, right? For some things, even Google, you know, Google Maps or Google Earth can can be used to display things. QGIS is a free GIS. You know, that's Esri is kind of the commercial standard, if you would. I think for the industry, QGIS is probably the current open source world standard. Um, so that's something that's available. I don't know, Martha, she came off mute. That wouldn't require some level of install, but in terms of browser based or lighter things, you have suggestions. I was I was also going to chime in and suggest that um, QGIS, which stands for Quantum uh, GIS, which is a free open source um, uh, tool to work with and manipulate shape files is a great resource there. Um, depending on the data set, um, you can make maps on open data itself. So if a data set has geography um, and, a lo and a location field in the data set itself, um, it, there's a there's a interactive sort of UI tool on uh, on open data itself. It's you look for the little the little button that says visualize. You can make a map on open data itself. If the data set that you're looking at, however, doesn't have that, or again is like a zip file to download. Um, a, let us know because we, you know, we are prioritizing getting those data sets that are not, that don't have location or aren't able to be visualized directly in open data um, to have, to have that geometry sort of on the data set itself. Um, and uh, let us know via the open data help desk, which is a, uh, Alex uh, just helpfully dropped the link in there. I know web forms, sometimes you're like, oh my God, no one's ever going to look at this. Um, the open data help desk, people actually, <laughs> we have a we have a whole team that is actively monitoring that, um, that communication method. And it's our main sort of intake for questions, for feature requests, for whatever, um, for open data. So yeah. Um, Thank you. That's a great question. And the uh, QGIS, uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about Q, uh, about GIS generally or like how to interact with GIS data sets, um, uh, uh, QGIS is, is great. And there's lots of good um, documentation on the internet for how to use it too, which is my favorite uh, thing about a tool is if lots of other people have already asked the questions on the internet <laughs> for me. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you, sure. Martha. That's helpful to know. Uh, somebody else asked af about community mapping after disaster disasters. Could you please repeat the name of the technology used and share any information on outreach, which typically completes the disaster mapping, or who completes the disaster mapping? Yeah. Um, yeah, the technologies I mentioned were all Esri products, so in our team here at emergency management that's generally what we're using for this type of work so i mentioned survey one two three 
is one of their kind of suite of tools, right? These are things that anybody can, you know, you can download them on the app store. Um, I'm an Apple person or whatever the equivalent is, right? Um, you know, so the idea is that potentially those people could use them or not um, maybe as trained, right? As long as they're, you know, either given access to a particular survey, for example, um, field maps is another one. It replaced a product called, or is replacing a product called Collector. Basically, field maps is a little bit more of, you know, detailed map-based view. Some of you might have a tablet, for example, to go out and collect um, information. I know Department of Buildings, for example, has used Collector, right, to go out and do building assessments. Survey 123 is traditionally used for more, you know, simple drop down questions, for example. Um, so, and you mentioned outreach, right? This is something, you know, we're doing a lot of work on now to try and improve our processes, right? How do we coordinate as a city? We have um, community engagement group uh, here at emergency management who will work say, with VOADs or, you know, volunteer community organizations um, to collect information. And, you know, a lot of the, the challenge um, and, and what we work on is, right, how, to, how do we coordinate that information? Um, so in the city, it's it will be often our office who does the kind of overall mapping. I mean, in a lot of places, the open com, you know open community will contribute a lot. That's that's you know most often you see that in either larger very large scale or disasters or places with fewer resources. Great. Uh, okay, let's take a couple more questions and see if we can get concise questions and answers here. So we have time for all the other ones. Uh, someone asked the hazard <clears throat> mitigation is really detailed and they'd like to thank the team for their work. How often is it updated? Uh, the official plan is updated on a five-year cycle, but the particular data, you know, that you would find in the website may be depending on what it is more frequently. So I'd encourage to, to, you know, folks to explore, but the same plan that gets signed off on for the city is, is every five years. So that'd be expected in spring 2024. Great. Uh, we had a suggestion for GISgeography.com to look at in addition to QGIS. And uh, we also have, if we wanted to work with some of the spatial data in the community risk assessment dashboards, how would we access that? Um, you can certainly reach out to me. My contact information will be there with any specific questions. Anything you see there um, is coming open from our um, from our ArcGIS online organization. So if you're, you know, if you're technically familiar with how to do that, you should just be able to find the endpoints, but I can, we can help um, get access to that as well. And then things that, that we're sort of responsible for is our agency, like coordinating the mitigation actions database, that's also on open data, um, for example. All right, thank you very much. This is terrific. Why don't we advance to the next slide and bring up Harry to talk about uh, DOT's experience with sharing data. Take it away, Perry. I think you're on mute. Perry, we can't hear you. Can you unmute? There we go. Hi, okay. sorry about that. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Perry Drew. I'm the Deputy Director of Geospatial Technologies at DOT IT and Telecom. Uh, today, I'll be presenting uh, how to share with your sisters. Uh, this is a new model for interagency interagency sharing uh, through ArcGIS Online. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to begin by describing how DOT shares data with sister agencies. Uh, traditionally, an agency like DEP would reach out to DOT and request something like uh, permit data. Uh, then the business units will come together and come up with kind of a sharing agreement. At this point, my team would meet with the IT team at the sister agency to set up an ETL to share the data. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here I have just some uh, hypothetical arrangements for an ETL. Uh, starting at the top, we could pull data from a DOT spatial database, store it in a DOT-owned FTP. Um, then uh, DOT would give access to open data. They'd have their own ETL to pull the data onto their database. So those are those little gears there as the ETLs. Um, next level down, uh, we could reserve or we could do the reverse of the top where three and one would give us uh, access to their FTP and then we could push updates and it would be in three and one's environment already. 
Uh, Can you just tell people what an ETL is? We have that question. Oh, sure. So uh, at like a high level, it's just kind of a method for how we, you know, uh, export, transform, and load data to another uh, location. So in this diagram, this gear represents maybe like a script we run to, you know, package data, maybe get rid of some fields, you know, package it up nice and then put it in a storage place and then we'd go to the FTP, which is the file transfer protocol. And essentially that's just a directory where we store the data where someone else can get access. Um, so that's just a typical model for sharing data between the sister agencies. Um, at the bottom, we have a, a slightly different one where um, we have an example where maybe an agency like DP wants to receive data through ArcGIS Online. So we would have an ETL to pull data from our internal spatial database, put it on our organization's ArcGIS Online, and then they can, they can view a service of the data. Uh, at the end of the day, each approach meets the request of each sister agency. However, um, it's also making it more complex to manage because uh, depending on the security or data needs of a sister agency, we may have to create redundant ETLs. Um, so for example, I may need to create two separate ETLs to say to send the same permit data to open data and DEP because the requirements for consuming the data are so different. Uh, next slide, please. And so in the last year or so, DOT has started receiving more requests to share data using ArcGIS Online. Uh, more groups have adopted the platform and they wanna use services for sharing information. Uh, back in November, Open Data reached out to DOT, uh, requesting that we start sharing our spatial data using ArcGIS Online Map Services. Um, at first, I wasn't so happy with this request. Um, we have an existing ETL; it's been working for you know many, many years now. Um, and I don't really, you know, I was thinking I don't really want to manage you know all these data sets on our organization. Uh, we tend to like to use it just for making applications, uh, you know. And so, you know, I just wasn't really happy with this kind of setup. I thought it was a little bit unnecessary. Um, and then the following day to this request, um, uh, some folks on my team were meeting with OTI to talk about their new um, uh, Esri Hub project. And Tom Swanson, who was the OTI GS uh, lead at the time, um, he started discussing, you know, the agency's vision to kind of centralize data sharing using ArcGIS Online. And you know, for us, this was kind of great because just the day before a group that's under OTI, uh, Open Data, they're asking us to provide them in this particular format. And in talking with OTI about this uh, this hub idea, they're asking us to put data on their hub. So we're like, well, if we put on the hub, it can be shared out to everyone else. Um, so, you know, this is very exciting for my team. We saw this opportunity to standardize on uh, the way we share uh, spatial data. Uh, we could send publicly available data to one spot, and then all the sister agencies could pick it up in a Esri format that they all kind of want or used to, or you know, maybe they're just used to that format. Uh, so in January, DOT and OTI started working on an SOP for this new type of sharing. Uh, by the end of the month, I started an ETL to push uh, parking meter updates um, using this method. And this data is now being used by Open Data and 311. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry about that. One more back, yeah, or two more back. Am I on the right? Uh, are we right? I think the next one, the diagram. Yeah, so um, here's an example of this new ETL. Uh, the data is processed and delivered to OTI's ArcGIS line using ArcPy. Uh, this is a library, uh, a Python library uh, created by Esri. Uh, there can be picked up by others. Uh, so instead of having many ETLs, I have one script that pushes specific feature classes to OTI at different intervals. So we have like a daily push, a weekly push, a monthly push. Uh, so you know, that's kind of nice. We don't have to have all these separate you know, uh, calls. It's all just one code base. Um, another benefit of this, if you look at the path between DOT and DEP at the bottom, uh, you'll notice that the arrows I used connecting the ETLs to ArcGIS Line go both ways. Uh, since ArcPy does all the heavy lifting, uh, an agency like DEP can push their own data to OTI. And then if I want to consume that here at DOT, uh, the code base we have is pretty similar. You know, 
earlier I showed you, this is how we push the data to ArcGIS Online, uh, but the same code base can be used to pull data from ArcGIS Online. Um, so, you know, so far, um, OTI hasn't made an announcement about this yet, but they're developing, you know, the hub for sister agencies. So uh, this would be great because they'll have documentation on what different data sets are available. They'll explain how to use them uh, using Esri's, you know, setup. And uh, hopefully OTI will make an announcement soon uh, to the other agencies. So far, this has kind of been a, a prototype or uh, we've been doing with OTI. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, so far we're only sharing uh, one data set um, this way. Uh, it's still the early days of the project. Uh, so, but I still see there's a lot of value in this because instead of, you know, you know, doing multiple different ETLs, we can kind of standardize and then, you know, hopefully things will get out faster. Uh, next few months, I'll be working with open data and through one to start migrating more data sets to this model. I guess at this point too, I should kind of apologize for like people who aren't working in the city because this has been pretty much focused on you know internal data sharing. Uh, however, I, the standardization on ArcGIS Online, particularly OTI's uh, organizational account, uh, we think this will also help with situations where uh, you'd find conflicting data sets online. Like you may go to uh, one agency's website and they're referencing data that DOT has. You compare that to what's an open data, and you know, maybe it's like it's off by a few records. Which one is you know the right one that I should use? Which is the most recent? Um, hopefully, if everyone's pulling from the same source, um, they'll reduce that. Um, but we'll see how it goes in the future. Um, you know, so I guess you know, in terms of my presentation, uh, that's it for me. My name is uh, Perry Drew again, and thank you for attending. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a question and it looked like you answered it. So let's just check that you, uh, this person has the correct understanding. They asked who will be the owners of the data once shared via the OTI hub. And based on what you said, they said this, okay, this implies each agency will still be the owners and managers of their own data sets. It's just shared and disseminated via the OTI portal. Is that correct? Did they get that? Yeah. You, uh, for us, it's kind of nice because, you know, you know, each agency has their own ArcGIS Online uh, for the most part, and we're still going to use it, you know, for DOT purposes. But for the situation where, like, oh, we have to share this data to open data. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Got put in the dark for a second. But yeah, so if, if it's something we're all trying to consume, especially for DOT, a lot of our data sets are public anyways. Uh, it just makes sense, you know, if you know, Nyson wants to pull something we're using. And we're delivering on a daily basis. We shouldn't separate a uh, separate ETL for them to get it. They should just use this source. Great. Thank you. Okay. We have the question what is AGOL? And it was answered ArcGIS Online. Thank you very much. And okay, let's advance the next slide and make sure we get in Matt's presentation uh, to tell us <laughs> what's going on at city planning. Take it away, Matt. Thanks, Lee. Uh, hello, Matt. Croswell, the GS team lead and open data coordinator at the Department of City Planning. Um, I'll be walking you through an overview of our open data products and some of the web applications that are available at City Planning and highlighting a few of the updates uh, for this year. Uh, next slide. First, we'll go over the open data catalog. Uh, next slide. We released around 140 different open data products. Um, they have varying update frequencies. Some are monthly, others quarterly. And many others are either less frequent or just um, updated as needed. Uh, looking at our monthly uh, open data products, you might be familiar with some of these. These include digital city map, uh, e-designation shapefile, and many of our zoning related data sets like zoning districts and other features, uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, zoning tax lot database. In our quarterly data sets, you'll see map Pluto and Pluto, which is a tax lot uh, based data set, which is one of our most widely used uh, in the city. Um, we'll be talking about an enhancement to the release uh, schedule of um, Matt Pluto later. Um, our other quarterly data sets include our Lion Street Centerline data, um, district boundaries for most ad admin and political districts and uh, citywide, 
uh, our property address directory and street name directory, uh, both of these which support our, our supportive files for our geo support, which is the official geocoding application for New York City. And then our less frequent and um, as needed data sets, you'll see um, a lot of new data sets here, including the capital planning database. This includes information on current and future capital projects uh, taking place in New York City that are reported through the capital commitment plan um, by NYC agencies. Um, and this is updated three times a year. We also put out census and demographic info for NYC based on the decennial census and the annual American Community Survey data that's released by the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, we have city facilities, including our facilities database and our city-owned and leased properties, or CULP. Um, another fairly recent uh, uh, new or newly added database is the housing database. This is updated twice a year, includes net housing unit totals for every year since 2010 based on DOB's building permits um, for their three primary construction types, uh, which are new construction, major alterations, and demolition. Um, these are also aggregated at uh, different geography levels, so you can have them at census track or block, uh, community district, NTA, uh, community district tabulation area, community district, or city council district. Um, we also put out a lot of uh, data sets dealing with the waterfront um, or climate and sustainability. Uh, these include data sets related to the waterfront revitalization program, uh, future high tide with sea level rise, uh, and waterfront publicly accessible areas related to our waterfront access map. Um, all of these data sets uh, can be uh, accessed in several locations, including um, archived copies of all of our releases on our own uh, city planning's own data portal called the Bytes of the Big Apple. Uh, next slide. So besides the Bytes of the Big Apple, which is city planning's um, open data portal on our own um, website, um, you can also access all of our open data on the New York City open data portal. And we make most of our open data also available on our own uh, ArcGIS online account. Um, City planning also puts out many web applications, and most of those web applications will feature our open data catalog um, in various ways. If you have any questions uh, about our open data, uh, I have the email here on the slide. You can email dcpopendata at planning.myc.gov. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'd like to talk about some of the um, updates or new, new data sets that are coming out for 2023. Uh, the first one is the building elevation and subgrade data. Uh, next slide. Uh, the building elevation subgrade data contains centroids for every New York City building with three main data points, uh, elevation at grade, elevation of the first actively used floor, and a subgrade value, which indicates if subgrade space exists for that building. Um, you can see in the illustration here that the elevation at grade can be at or below street level, depending on that building's relationship with uh, the, the ground and, and then the slope around it. Um, all of the elevation measurements for each of the buildings was recorded uh, as feet above sea level. Um, and in, it's in the North American vertical datum of 1988. Uh, DCP contracted a third party vendor to collect this data uh, from a horizontal LIDAR and street imagery capture at the street level. Uh, next slide. Um, this data was collected so that we could better understand flood risk for New York City's building stock and support citywide flood resiliency planning. Um, it can be used to identify building typologies with high flood risk, uh, identify buildings with subgrades, and the city will be using this to develop planning strategies uh, to better understand where to invest in our infrastructure to mitigate impacts of climate change and to target outreach to residents and property owners uh, who are where buildings are at, at high flood risk. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can currently access this data as a CSV table on DCP's Bytes of the Big Apple website. Um, we have links to the data, uh, data dictionary, as well as a readme file. Uh, you can um, also map this data by joining the CSV to the 22v1 version of the building footprints data um, and using the, the bin field or the building identification number field. Uh, this data will soon be updated on the open data portal. Um, it's just going through its review as, an, as a new data set. But like I said, you can access it on our website uh, as of today. Uh, next slide. 
Another update isn't necessarily a new data set, but just an enhancement into the release schedule for our Map Pluto data set that we're calling Map Pluto Miner. Um, you may already be familiar with our Pluto and Map Pluto data sets. Uh, Map Pluto is a spatial data set that merges the tax lots from the Department of Finance's digital tax map uh, with our own Pluto table. Um, the Pluto table is an extensive table that includes more than 70 fields derived from several city agencies on zoning, land use, and other property data. Uh, next slide. Uh, Map Pluto is, uh, is, is used for the source for most of the property information return in our Zola application that you can see on the slide. Um, we started to receive increased feedback from uh, Zola users that the zoning district boundaries on the Zola map did not match the zoning information being returned in the search results pane, as you can see uh, here. Uh, in the example on this slide, you can see that for 262 Bergen Street in Brooklyn, on the map, it's showing that it's in an R7A zoning district, but in the search results pane, it's saying that it's in an M12 district. The reason for this mismatch is that there are two different data sources for these different data uh, sets that are in the application. And those two different data sources have different update frequencies. So the map uses our zoning districts data set, which is updated monthly, and the search results uses our map Pluto data set, which was updated quarterly. So this led to these scenarios where if there was a rezoning, um, the results would be updated in the zoning district field right away or every month, but not necessarily in the Pluto data set. It would depend on when the next Pluto release was scheduled. So this is where this map Pluto minor um, enhancement comes in. Uh, next slide. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Well, when we do get to the next slide, um, we'll talk about the um, release of map Pluto. So traditionally, map Pluto was released quarterly, and you might be familiar with that, something like 22 V1, V2, V3. Uh, the map Pluto minor releases are scheduled to be monthly. Um, so these would happen in between the months of the quarterly releases. So you can see what a new um, uh, release schedule would look like with the 23 V1 being like the major quarterly releases, followed up by minor releases of 23 V1.1 or 23 1.2 before you get to another major release. Uh, next slide. The difference um, between the major and minor releases is that in the minor releases, only the zoning fields in that Pluto are updated. So you can see on the left which fields would actually be updated. Um, and just want to point out that this, the minor uh, or monthly releases do not include um, updates to the tax lots themselves. So if a tax lot was split, merged, or converted to condo, that would not be included until the next major release. Um, and this also does not include any other of the other attribute updates. Next slide. Um, and so there's a few other uh, open data enhancements I just like want to go over. Um, next slide. So in our housing uh, database uh, data set, um, the housing database now includes building permits from the Department of Buildings new tracking system DOB now. Um, if you're not familiar with the housing database, the housing database contains uh, net housing unit totals. Uh, from DOB permits since 2010, uh, based on those three primary construction uh, job types that we mentioned before, new construction, ma major alteration, demolition. Up until recently, this was only attainable through DOB's uh, building identification system, or BIS. Uh, so this enhancement ensures that all building permits are incorporated, whether they're submitted in B uh, DOB now system or not. And it makes it easier for users to track housing units in one data set uh, instead of the multiple data sets that are on open data from DOB. Uh, next slide. Um, and another uh, update is to our geo service with biweekly UPAD updates. So first, um, what is geo service and, and what does that mean? Uh, so to take a step back, I mentioned earlier that geo support is the official geocoder for NYC. Uh, this data, the data that supports geo support is updated quarterly and mostly consists of either Lion Street centerline data, our street name dictionary, and our property address file. Um, there are two main versions of geo support, GBAT and desktop, which is the desktop version of geo support, and geo service, which is the cloud-based version. Um, so DCP introduced a new file uh, called 
UPAD or updated property address file, which is updated every two weeks, uh, which is more frequently than the, the normal pad file. Um, and right now those pad or those UPAD uh, updates are only available as download to be incorporated into the desktop GBAT version. Um, so this enhancement now makes sure that those UPAD updates are in the geo service. So if you're using the cloud service, you now have those biweekly UPAD updates. So you'll have better access and to more updated uh, bins, VBLs, and addresses. Uh, next slide. Uh, moving on from our open data to our web applications. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Um, the first application I'd like to go over is probably one of our more well-known applications, uh, Zola. So Zola uh, provides a simple way to research zoning regulations. Uh, you can find your zoning prop for your property. You can set new proposals uh, for uh, rezonings uh, in your neighborhood and learn wh where city planning initiatives are happening throughout the city. Um, so the update here is, as, as we mentioned before, uh, Zola will now have that monthly zoning updates within the search results via that Matt Pluto minor update. Uh, next slide. The Equitable Development Data Explorer, or EDDE, uh, was mandated uh, to be created last year through Local Law 78, I'm sorry, of 2021. Um, the, that mandated both the EDDE tool be created and also that we have give the public access to racial equity reports. So city planning worked with the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development to launch this application last year. It serves as a resource to equip New Yorkers with data to navigate challenging conversations about housing affordability, displacement, and racial equity uh, in our city. Um, it also facilitates the creation of the racial equity reports, uh, which are triggered by ULIP applications that generate an increase uh, that are generated if the ULIP application is going to increase the um, residential square footage by 50,000 square feet or non-residential area by 200,000 square feet. Um, the major update here is a, a new contact page to submit feedback. Um, before it was uh, harder to send in feedback about the application or the data. So now there is a, a nice forum page that allows uh, the users to submit feedback to both city planning and HPD. Next slide. Um, our population fact finder tool um, allows users to easily create study areas or choose predefined geographies like community district and examine associated population data showing the latest demographic, social, economic, and housing characteristics um, and how they've changed over time. Uh, recent updates to this application include useful quick fact pop-ups for selection. So when you make a selection, it'll return um, quick facts about that geographic area. Um, and also, it will be brought back um, a helpful chart visualization on the Explorer page that uh, went away and um, came back due to popular demand. Uh, we will be updating this app to incorporate the 2017 to 2021 American Community Survey data that should be um, available later this year. Next slide. Almost done here, wrapping up. So where can you access these web applications? There are several different um, locations. You can go to our website, uh, basically the same page as our open data, just one tab over on the maps and geography section. You can see all of the uh, different applications that we have available. This isn't comprehensive at the moment, um, but we are working with our web team to get a more comprehensive list. Um, I also put on here an old uh, sort of retired website, NYC Planning Lab site. This does give you access to a lot of our core applications, even though this page itself isn't updated. Um, and then any of our applications, uh, web applications, story maps, or dashboards that are created in ArcGIS Online can be accessed through our uh, ArcGIS Online uh, account. And last slide um, is just questions. So if you have any questions, about all of what we just discussed, please let me know. And I feel like there was a lot coming in in the chat. Great. Yeah, there was a lot of coming in the chat, some of which has been answered. So let me kind of scroll through this and <clears throat> pick a few. And uh, we can go a few minutes over to address 
questions, so we'll do that. Uh, let's see, the question about lions and tigers and bears <laughs> not addressed in the uh, in the chat. Uh, there's a question for the open data team. Maybe they can take at the end about uh, the local laws that apply. Um, Question for zoning districts, are there data sets that show the entire history of rezoning, such as where new borders were added? Um, yes and no. So there is part of the GIS zoning features data set. There are six different features. One of them is the zoning map amendment. So anytime um, the zoning map is amended or changed, that physical area where that change happened will be uh located or listed in that data set it will show you the area that was rezoned but it doesn't necessarily tell you what it was prior and what it was rezoned to so you'd have to do um a little bit of investigating either using zap data which is data from our zoning application portal or going back through our archive um our zoning districts goes back to i believe 2010 or 9 um and then you can actually see you can line them up between different releases and see what those changes were great uh got a couple of questions about pluto is it a reliable source for zip codes and census tracts and also since it's at the tax lot level are there any plans to start tracking more data at the individual building or bin level um we do release some building or we do have some building related information um, in Pluto, uh, but that does get tricky when it comes to lots that have multiple um, buildings. Uh, so that that point, they're either aggregated or a primary building is used. Um, could you say the other part of that? The other question was about whether Pluto is a reliable source for zip codes and census tracts. Um, it's definitely reliable for census tracts because that's um, using our geo support system to populate those values. So it's definitely um, reliable for census track or block. For zip codes, um, I have to check the data dictionary on that, but I believe that might be coming in from DOF data. And I would say that Pluto is not a great source for addresses. So I would um, I would say it's probably like 80% reliable uh, in zip code, but uh, you may want to actually take a zip code data set um, if you're if you're trying to look for zip codes. You know, there were what is this, okay. I to add on a, there were a bunch of questions. It looks like or a few you know, a little discussion about zip codes. Um, mm -hmm. So Martha had mentioned zip code tabulation area, which is a census geography, although maybe not current enough. Um, I was always school, and it's important to remember the way we think about it is. A, zip code is really a postal route yeah in a collection of postal routes it's not actually an area so certain yeah. emergency management they tend not to line up well they're great for sort of messaging because we get mail and everyone knows their zip code but i always treat it rarely and if you have a good statistical substitute i would encourage right. you to use it i would agree with that and our, i definitely know our population division would uh, highly recommend if you're using anything to if you're using census data or you're analyzing census data, please use a geography based or a census based geography, such as census tract or, or neighborhood tabulation areas that are created here at city planning or otherwise known as NTAs. And the newly uh, created district, which is sort of kind of an uh, almost an equivalent to Puma, but they are different, which is the community district tabulation areas. So if you're looking to analyze demographic or census data, at a community district level, even though we make them available at the community district level, we would recommend using the CDTA, which is the community district tabulation area. Great. Uh, there's a question about several years ago, there's an effort to map all underground infrastructure. Where's that? Um, I know that there's some work going on between the mayor's office of operations and some folks that are involved in Gizmo. That's an open organization for folks involved in mapping in uh, New York City. Uh, yeah. I don't know if anybody else here has any comments on? Yeah, that's we had been involved. It, it's moved a little bit, I think, to the city. I don't know if the, the Gizmo was working with NYU as well. It was like yes. a community outreach piece. I believe there is some um, community development block grant funding that is currently being used to try and, you know, kick things up again. Um, 
and so maybe some future time there'd be some updates um there's that's just sort of the phase of that starting now so hopefully some good news to come maybe next year's presentation we'll reach out to them uh let's see you've dressed stacy yes data we've talked about zip codes and let me see if i can get one more question here this is the lions tigers bears commentary in the chat um can we download population data? I assume you can, they can get that from the uh, population fact finder page, Matt? Uh, yeah, on the fact finder page, you can download your selections. Um, the Census Bureau is your best bet to get most census data, um, but we do make uh, a, t a table available for the, some fields that are available for NYC decennial census. Um, it's on our website in the population page. Um, and we're working to get this out onto open data, even though it's basically not a requirement since it's uh, Census Bureau data. Uh, but if you do have a need for that, uh, you can email that DCP open data at planning.nyc.gov and we can connect you to the data. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna respect the time here. I see there are a bunch of other questions. Uh, here are our email addresses, please, if you've got any uh, questions, kindly email the um, folks on the presentation. 